Hey everybody, Dr. Dave Marquis here, and today I wanted to talk to you about some things related to how our eyes and our brain function and help us to integrate all the other senses that we have and everything that we interrelate with. Many people come to me that have had traumatic brain injuries and don't even know it. Sometimes it's innocuous, like they just might be playing a sport that they play regularly, like soccer, where they're heading the ball over and over again. Or sometimes it might be a little bit more obvious, where you might be playing baseball and you actually get clocked in the head with a ball or a bat or somebody's cleat or an elbow. Yeah, in basketball, that happens a lot as well. So there's a lot of athletic injuries that people kind of acquire along the way, and they don't necessarily associate that with an actual traumatic brain injury. It, seems like, ah, you know, it just I was just playing around. We usually think that there has to be either some type of uh, visible damage or maybe you get knocked out. And certainly in those moments, that would qualify for a traumatic brain injury. But more often than not, the ones that we end up suffering from almost in a silent way initially until you get enough symptoms amassed to have a diagnosable condition those happen to us in an innocuous fashion. That's one category that I want to address a little bit and how to evaluate that and what we can do for it. But then there's another category and that has to do with some of those things that are chronic degenerative neural inflammation. Of course, we've got Alzheimer's kind of topping that list. But another one that I see a lot of is microvascular dementia, where people have started to lose much of the blood flow to really important parts of the brain. Not, not that there's an unimportant part of the brain, but some of the ones that um, we lose first commonly, like our frontal lobe, are where a lot of our personality resides and our motivation and our drive and our ability to stay energetic throughout a day. And we'll oftentimes just chalk up the demise of that portion of the brain to aging. And I feel that's unfair to all of us. So that's a second category. And then there's a third category that really interests me, and that's in the developmental side of the brain and the remediation of some of the primitive reflexes that an individual is naturally born with because they help us get through those first couple years of life. But many people carry them forward, and it becomes an impediment to successfully integrating and, and doing other things in life. So... Those are three distinctly different categories, and yet all three of them share a commonality in terms of the evaluation. One of the tools that we use when we're evaluating the brain is the eyes. Our eyes innervate 80% of our cortex. And as such, the cortex dictates much of our ability to move our eyes through their cardinal planes. So you can actually use eye movement as an evaluation tool to determine how efficiently specific lobes of the brain are working. I often default to a computer-aided version of that type of diagnostics, which is called right eye. It's a camera built into a screen that actually locks onto the individual's pupils, and then it has them run through each of the cardinal planes of eye movement. And it breaks those cardinal planes down into three categories. One is called saccades, one is called pursuits, and the other one is fixation. So I'm going to start with the middle one there. Pursuits is basically going from point A to point B. Real simple, right? A saccade is going back to point A again. And fixation is your ability to converge and dilate. And you might say, well, Doc, why are you telling me this? I mean, that, that's just, yeah, that's how my eyes move. Well, that's really important stuff because some people can't do that efficiently. And that tells you a lot about what the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, and cerebellum are or aren't doing. And when you think about what these regions of the brain do other than eye movement, you'll start to see how important that is. Our frontal lobe, for example, that's where our drive, our motivation, our intent, our ability to focus, that's where that all lives. Our temporal lobes, that's where much of our associative centers for memory lie. So your, your ability to see a letter and turn it into a word, or see a face and remember the name, or uh, see numbers and do a math problem. Now that's going to tie in some of your parietal lobe as well. And then the ability to do those things efficiently and in a timely fashion, 
That's all cerebellum and the midbrain. Your basal ganglia allows you to do them smoothly. So, for example, this, just this last week I had a really interesting case where an individual came in and they had no awareness of a concussion previously, but when I was working with them, I'm like, there's something not right in terms of their body awareness. So we ran a right eye, and sure enough, their awareness was like two standard deviations off of where it should be in terms of body positioning. Now these types of individuals are unstable. These are the ones where you ask them to go up or down stairs and they're going to have to hold on to those rails because as soon as they tilt their head, their ability to keep that riding reflex intact goes down the garbage can. I've seen distance runners with a very similar phenomena where they're putting their foot a distance from where their brain thinks it's landing and they sprain their ankle repeatedly. So people can actually injure themselves in a variety of different ways and not really understand why they're so clumsy or why they bump into the, the door jam when they walk through or why they feel a little bit unsteady when they're going downstairs but not necessarily up or when they're on a distance run or when their environment changes and they, they don't have the, the typical layout of the furniture in the room. Anytime they start to change things like that, if their associative centers aren't intact, their, their whole world changes. Well, this can play out in a variety of ways. It can play out in your ability to focus, your ability to uh, uh, succeed academically, your ability to not be anxious when you're driving, uh, your ability to pay attention when an individual is communicating with you and actually retain a string of information rather than the first thing they said and the last thing they said. So you can start to see how this really plays out in real life. And it might seem silly at first that, okay, the doc's looking at my eyes. What, what, what's that going to do for my anxiety? Or what's that going to do for my balance? Or, you know, you fill in the blank. But everything starts here, guys. Our brain is like the, the keystone to the wellness of the rest of the body. I've talked about the autonomic nervous system in other talks, and I, I've talked about the uh, ability to oxygenate the body and, and keep your extremities warm and your nails healthy. That's all brain. So recognize that each of us, the, the take home that I'm trying to share with you here, that I want you each to recognize that if you have something that's not really explained well, you might look upstairs between your ears and, and think, well, you know what? Maybe I have had some multiple micro traumas that have led to a cumulative load of inflammation in the brain. Maybe I do need to do a little bit of repair. And you don't necessarily have to be showing overt symptoms. I mean, I've got colleagues, so, some of the most highly intelligent individuals that I can think of that have had that happen to them where they've had to do some brain work because of a micro trauma and it was setting them back and oftentimes it's people around you that might notice the difference they might say hey you know you might seem a little bit off what's going on and you're like well, I don't know I'm just tired or you know I might be fighting a cold or something but recognize that our brain is the house of energy for the rest of this body. And we've got tools like this right eye device and so many different fun brain exercises that individuals can do on their own once they've been taught how to start to strengthen areas of deficit in the brain. So we always want to treat metabolically to make sure it's fueled and not inflamed, but then we got to get in there and make sure that it's performing optimally. You can think of it as physical therapy for the brain. It's just you're not actually going to see that muscle flex. You're going to see the performance of that region of the brain, and that will be that muscle flexing. I hope this was interesting, and I, I hope it kind of piques your intrigue so that you want to look into more ways that you can optimize your own brain function. But recognize that this is a short list of things that an individual might be dealing with that can, that type of testing can give them insight into. Dyslexia poor at mathematics, difficult time retaining information, particularly if it's a string of items that they're supposed to retain, anxiety, insomnia, balance, 
eye-hand coordination. All of those things can be improved if an individual looks at how well their brain is functioning. Remember the right eye. Look that one up online. It's a pretty cool diagnostic tool and it's one that we offer here in our office and a lot of other functional med offices. In addition to functional med offices, there are other uh, visual specialists that offer this type of evaluation. And I encourage people to engage in that because the eyes are one of the undervalued tools that give you a boatload of information as to how your brain is working. I hope that was interesting. Have a great day.